Tonight, thanks to Lynette, we have the honor of having Eleanor Becker. Uh, Eleanor is a writer, uh, a researcher, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, she does uh, special projects, we're doing a special project on, on the Queen. And um, it's a special time for us. I mean, although we are in December, November 11th, we were honored, some of us here were honored to be a part of the, uh, uh, the reenactment uh, of the Queen's uh, passing, November 11th. Um, which also is going to be shown tonight on, on Channel 53 at 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. If we get home on time. Um, Sa we Saturday at 11 p.m. And Saturday at 11? Every Saturday this month until the 23rd. Yeah. Your reenactment is going to be shown? Yeah, Tom. Well, half of it, part one. Okay. So what Tom wrote, and most of us here participated. So today, let's welcome Eleanor Max. So thank you, um, Steve. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. You have to use your big voice. My big voice. Oh dear. Um, past. Thank you, everybody. We all um, past and present. Um, we really thank you. And thank you actually, Jeanette and Naliana and Patrice for the flowers I transformed just by by these wonderful flowers. So. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity for sharing my work on um, Livio Kalani uh, that now goes back um, many years. I've been in this room where you are um, a number of times and I've always learned something. Um, and I'm sure tonight will be no exception. Whether anybody else will learn, we'll see. Um, but I have Actually, before I, before I go on and say I have trouble, I have some eye trouble, so I may have to uh, do this to keep the, uh, to keep the air. Uh, you could turn off the light. No, it's, yeah. it's contradictory. I need the light, but it has to be a certain way, so I'll probably be. Do you want to try it there and turn off the front light or the other side? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Is that better? A little intimate, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, can you see? I think it's better with, actually, thank you. With? I think it's better with, yeah. But anyway, um, I have other people to thank. <laughs> thank you, Barry. For being here, and Kikuni is, is the first and most important um, of those people. Um, I met him in 2004 or five when I was beginning the research that um, that led to, the, to my first writing about Hawaii, which was this um, special issue of the nation um, that was published in 2008. Um, it's called, if you can't see it, um, Famous Are the Flowers, Hawaiian Resistance, <coughs> Then and Now. And it was about the overthrow of the monarchy and the contemporary sovereignty movement. Then the then contemporary sovereignty movement. Um, but Kekuni became my inspiration, um, as he is for so many people, um, and for so many reasons, um, not the least of which was that everything he said about the history, of, everything he said and believed about the history of the Hawaiian people was true. And for Kekuni, there was no separation between what was true and what was right. Um, Kekuni introduced me to many people here, including Lynette. He used to like to say, this is Eleanor, she's from America. <laughs> he would have a wonderful twinkle when he would say that. And he was also a constant reminder um, by his presence and his conversation that the events involved in the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom uh, were not long past. Um, he was already in his 80s when we met. And as you know, many of those of you who know him, know uh, both his mother's mother and his father's mother were very closely connected uh, with the queen. And I'm sure that many of you heard him tell uh, these stories, but to bring Kekuni's stories back um, for a minute. Um, on the walls of his house was a painting of the Hawaiian flag given to his maternal grandmother uh, by Lili Okawani herself who was paying for the grandmother's education that she did for the education of a lot of young girls. 
um, when his grandmother married a white ship captain, the painting was hung on the inside of a closet door where it couldn't be seen. And his, the children and grandchildren forbidden to talk about it. Um, which is why we have to talk about it now, is what Kikun people say. Um, his other grandmother was one of the queen's kuas um, living on the grounds of her estate in what he and the marriage. Um, the site that was so painful to him that he did not want to go there, like to go there, I don't know if he ever did, but he didn't like to go there um, even to hear Aaron Mahi's trio um, play the songs that um, Ilio Kuani wrote on that spot. Um, it makes me too sad, is what he told me. So Kekuni was an expansive thinker, but he was also a stickler for precision. I don't think he saw any of the pages I'm going to read tonight, um, but he saw others. And they always came back with little penciled notes in a delicate hand, um, always demanding greater accuracy or subtlety or understanding. And I have no doubt that if you were here tonight, as I really wish you were, uh, he would do the same with any you know, say. Um, besides Kikuni, I, I well, I, actually, you know, I didn't say that I, I live in Oregon, so, so it's really been as an outsider that I've, um, in many ways, that I've dropped into this work. But there are many people who um, have helped me find my way in Hawaiian history, archivally, intellectually, politically, or spiritually. Some warmly and personally, others just through their work, and some, as in the case of Tom, they're both Eliana. Um, the scholarship that's making it possible, not only for Hawaiians, but for other people, to begin to comprehend um, the brilliance and resilience of Hawaiian culture is was really heroic intellectual work. And there is an ever-broadening library of this, of this work. I guess you're hearing some of it in these series of Lynette um, shares other others of it in her in the TV series. I have to just tell you, too, just a word about the strong Hawaiian community in Portland, which has made it possible for me to maintain at least some sense of connection to Hawaii and my home. Um, that community has had a lot of losses this year. Um, most centrally, a woman named Diva Yamashiro. I don't know if any of you know Diva, um, but she um, but she's, she was the founder of an organization called the Keikakui Foundation in Vancouver, Washington, right across the river, and sponsored many um, language classes, dance classes, and among many, and she actually, I have to say that Diva's cultural power in Vancouver, not only in the Hawaiian community, but beyond, and she's created, she created a tremendous amount of recognition for the Hawaiian community. The Northwest, who work in Vancouver. She was the sponsor of the Northwest Group troupe for Kalei Maya Reenactment, and I was part of. Um, was thrilled to be able to play the journalist on Miriam Michelson. I recognized her from seeing uh, from seeing you together here. <coughs> I've loved, I've loved Miriam's words, and especially I've always loved it's the old battle of the white man against the brown, the mighty man's right, strength against weakness. I have to say that every time I came to the place where I had to say, without ruining it, Mrs. Kuai Heilani Humble, I, I would have, it's very hard to say it without breaking the rhythm, but I have to say it. And I have to mention, too, I'm a very close friend. Alice Kapiwani Noam, who is dying of decades cancer in California, um, as we meet. Mainstay of the Kalei Miley Elite Troop, um, among many other things, she sort of played Keanu, so she did Keanu's piano, talk and used his PowerPoint um, after her performance at his home. Um, we were jointly students in a little, um, a tiny 
Hawaiian language class taught by our friend Laskea Byrne, who in turn began her language studies here with Tuti um, Kanakele. And until very recently, and well, again, I think Dan Kent comes back to dance with Anna De Silva. So, so these are very real ties. There are not enough of them, but um, they are sustaining to those people, and they can pass some of that sustaining sustenance on to others. So I'm going to stop these introductory comments by telling you how I got into this work in the first place. And I basically started on a family trip um, to Maui. It was my first trip to Hawaii in um, 1995. I am not someone who usually hears voices, uh, but I was reading a guidebook that said something like, in 1893, a group of American back planters overthrew the queen, and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> Essentially, that was the equivalent. And a voice in my head literally said, no way. It just didn't happen like that. Um, when I got home, I began reading um, Hawaiian history, and eventually began the deeper research that lay in time to the Kuni and to the nation of peace. In all the years that I've been working on trying to tell the Queen's story since. So I often watch Lynette's fascinating interviews with the scholars doing this remarkable new work in Hawaiian history. Um, many with very deep ancestral roots and deep knowledge of them. My own genealogy, um, which is mostly lost in the very different tragedies of Eastern European Jewish history, provides no connections, indeed no genealogical connections to Hawaii, whatever. Not being Hawaiian is a great gap, it's an unbridgeable gap. I suspect that some of you in this room, in some sense, know or can know Queen Lilia Kalani better uh, than I ever will. Uh, no matter how much I try, how many years I try. And I have no doubt either that there are Hawaiian resources, Hawaiian, Hawaiian language resources, unknown to me or impenetrable by me, even if I did know them, that would alter or at least enrich whatever portrait of the Queen I am able to come up with. Um, and I, I think that will happen. Um, I think a Hawaiian, a Hawaiian writer, a Hawaiian scholar will, will be producing such a thing in time, but it's, it's, a, it's a time consuming thing, obviously. All I can say is that when I heard that voice on Maui all those years ago, I listened. And I'm very grateful to the Hawaiians who've helped me along the way. So that's a lot of introduction, but what I want to try to do tonight is introduce you not so much to Queen Lilio Kalani, which would be impossible, um, but to a biography of Queen Lilio Kalani, uh, which is a very different thing. The Queen was a person, a human being like us, who actually woke up every morning and went to bed every night happy, sad, young, old, sick or well, um, every day, for seven, in her case, for 79 years. Um, a biography is a mere book, um, three or four hundred pages. If you want to think about unbridgeable gaps, um, think, think about that one. A book goes forward and back. Yeah, you could pick it up anywhere. But a life goes inexorably forward, birth to death, quite independent of events the world may deem historic. Between the person and the book are the leavings of a life out of which a biography is necessarily made. The physical residue of a lifetime of changing personal relationships and changing political historical circumstances. If you just think for a moment about your own uh, attics, your trunks, okay, your own your own letters, your own scrapbooks, your, your own 
whatnots, it probably includes your grandmothers, whatnots, or whatever. I mean, you, and you compare, you compare what, what, what your stuff to your actual life, you see, you know, right away what's more complicated and rich and real. I mean, the material residue is not all we leave, or so we hope. And obviously, it is not all that was left by the Queen. Um, but it is the place where a biography or any other attempted depiction of the Queen um, has to start. Not where it ends, but where it starts. So I want to tell you a little bit about the sources for reconstructing the Queen's life. The most important source is right over here in, in the archives, in this archive. Um, and I don't know if any of you have done this kind of research or if you've seen it. I bet you have. You know, like Tom has to know. Um, this is a finding aid that's over, that's over here. It's a public document. It's called M93. Um, it's a, it's the, produced by the librarians over the years. It's the, it's the central repository, really, of they say it's nine linear feet of papers and comic books and ledgers. Um, it is full of treasures. Um, anybody prowling in them will find one, will, will be attracted to, to ones that seem particularly treasury to you. One, one that I liked right from the beginning um, is. Uh, you can see these, you can look at these afterwards, like, I'm trying to this is, this is a sketch of her childhood um, that we, we know was written, the beginning of a sketch of her childhood, we know was written well before the sketch in her, um, what she says about it in the autobiography, because, I'll say more about this in a minute, but because it, we know that it was in her archives, in, in her desk, in 1895, when she was arrested and when Judd came and took all her papers. Um, so there's also um, an interesting thing about this M93 is that the last 22 pages of it are the catalog made by the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Judd on that day that she was arrested. And he went over to, to Washington Place and emptied her desk and her safe and bureau drawers and whatever they could find. And you might remember in the autobiography, um, she says um, that she saw a Judd turning the corner to her house um, just as she was being taken away. And that the only document, um, she says, this is about the only document um, which has been returned to me is my will. So this. The second, the second part of this is, um, is, all, is all those stolen documents. So it's a, a real window into the, to the Queen's life as it was in that moment in 1895. One of my favorites I can't resist mentioning is um, Judd is the opposite of a professional librarian. He makes his own comments on, on everything. And this is, um, this document is his as 26, his comment is, paper found crumbled up, obscene comments on cabinet and other officers of the government. So he's calling the Queen's document obscene, but what it really is, and come, come look at it afterwards. And she's telling who these guys really are, and here's somebody um, <coughs> talking to a young guy, uh, keeps two girls in some place, you know. She's, she, they're what she knows about them. I mean, it, it's not, they're not obscene comments. There's also another one. It's a, it's a letter from um, Charles Bishop. The judge says, good advice. So he doesn't keep his nose, doesn't keep his opinions out of here. Another big source is the Bishop Museum. There's a 53-page um, finding aid, um, much less accessible than the one over here. Um, within these collections and others, there are hundreds of pages of the Queen's letters and diaries. Um, the letters, mainly, you have to go through all these things to find yourself, um, sort of hunting and pecking. 
the diaries, um, which have also been divided between the state archives and the Bishop Museum, are now close to being um, close to being in process of being published uh, in a comprehensive edition um, annotated by David Forbes. That it will be a um, companion volume to his annotated um, um, introduction to. Um, Hawaii story by Hawaii's Queen that came out a couple of years ago. Another source of biographical insight into the Queen is, of course, her songs, and how wonderful it would be um, if we could turn to them and come closer through them to the most intimate thoughts and experiences and feelings. If we could match a particular song to a particular private or political moment. In some cases, you can. And in many other instances, it is much more difficult to make the connections. And to go a step further, in some, in some cases, it is almost the reverse. Um, that is, that you have already to know the details of an incident or event um, before you can understand uh, what she's saying about it in a song. Um, in um, Noe Noe Silva's uh, analysis of, of um, A.I. Nakhalani in Aloha Betrayed um, is, is a case in point. Really interesting um, analysis of that song. Um, the, the, <coughs> even the, the compilers of the songbook of Kui and I uh, say of the beautiful um, Sanoi, they say, there is more to this text than meets the eye. In 100 years removed from the event and its principles, we can probably do little more than enjoy the song and wonder at its secrets. And I think that if if they couldn't do more than that with Sam Senoli, I don't know. If any biographer could, certainly not an English language biographer. Um, and lastly, as, as sources, the stuff out of which a biography is made, there is the autobiography, um, which is a powerful and important literary and political achievement. And it's become a primary source for Hawaiian history in many, in many instances. But from a biographical point of view, it's, it's more limited than meets the eye because it is discreet, to say the least. You probably are all aware of, of the discreetness of her comments about her mother-in-law. Um, um, so it has, it has to be read as sort of a back and forth in um, in a counterpoint with other sources that you might have that illuminate the same moment. She told a lot in Hawaii story um, that Hawaiian history and historiography would be much the weaker for her not having said, but she also kept a lot of secrets. So, so after all that, I'm going to turn, um, turn to my book itself. The rest of this talk is, is, is going to be read story. Okay, it's not so much talk story. But I just want to add a couple of further thoughts. And that is that the difference between these sources, these, these materials, that I think it's important to be aware of, for, for, for anyone to be aware that that's what a biography depends on. But the difference between that and, and these things in an actual biography is interpretation. Um, there are no rules in biography for how to go from M93 to a page of your own. Um, there, are no, there are really no rules in biography because every life is different and every weavings of a life are different and every biographer has to struggle with what's, what's the What's the way to tell the story? A biography is not like an intact bowl found in some archaeological dig. It's more like something is tentatively reassembled out of the shards of the dig that the assembler can only hope bears some resemblance to the lost original. So what inner as well as outer forces really determined the shape of this life? What are its great themes? 
I do not even want to begin to tell you or to remember myself for variety. The, the, the variety of thoughts I've tried out um, as, I've, as I've begun the work of interpretation of the life of the coins. I've looked through the themes that run through it. There's themes of power, there's themes of love. Um, but I can tell you that the the thing that I came to, the theme that I came to believe um, is is greater than the others, and that is guiding my book, um, as I believe it did her life, is something that all 19th century Hawaiians, and indeed everyone who looked at Hawaii in the 19th century, came to know too well, and that is very sadly the theme of Hawaiian death. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to start off where where my book starts. Um, I'll just start. Um, the book starts in 1848. After a prologue, it starts in 1848, which, let's see, um, which was called, which was known as Anum Mortuum, the Year of Death. And it starts right, it's going to start right here. Um, at uh, December 30th, 1848. Um, Lydia Kalani is 10. Lydia, she's Lydia, she's 10. On December 30th, 1848, toward the end of a series of epidemics that would cause the 1849 census to declare the past 12 months the honor mortuum, the year of death. A melancholy procession, including the kings, the chiefs, important foreigners, and thousands of grieving natives assembled near the compound where the king had his home, and made its way to the royal tomb known as Pohukaina for the burials of three more dead chiefs. They were 27, 18, and three years old. <coughs> What pageantry accompanied the dead elite to their graves? The soldiers, the feather standards, the flag, the king's band, its western march, and somber duet with the Hawaiian's wails. And how little these honors assuaged the dread that was in every Hawaiian heart. This is um, Commandment 3, quote. Official reports have reached me on the rapid decimation of the native race which caused me a severe pang of sadness, staggering in its intensity, as the realization dawned upon me that this catastrophe facing the race spelled the death knell of Hawaii, King Kamehameha III, who cried out to his people a few years before. Now the decimation was a literal fact. Between the measles, whooping cough, and influenza, which have raged among Hawaiians, it is estimated that not less than 10,000 have been swept away, or about one-tenth of the population in the source report. The mausoleum itself held a different measure of loss, for though only a quarter century old, the royal crypt was already too crowded. Unlike the chiefs who had died before them, whose caskets lay side by side, draped in satins and silks, today's dead would be buried in a single hole, Watching as the remains of three young relatives who were all part of her daily life were layered into the ground was a thoughtful 10-year-old member of the royal family, known at the time as Lydia, in her first morning clothes, and the child was frightened. The dead were being stacked oldest first, and the one on top was her little sister. The crypt was dank and dark. A few years later, a mourner at another funeral wrote, I never felt so subdued, so mortal, never obtained a clearer view of the end of all earthly power than in that tomb. And I believe the future of Lilio Kalani felt the same. Long after the bodies of the Ali'i had been moved to a larger resting place, and when the kingdom itself was dying, she paused in the writing of her autobiography in Washington, D.C., and remembered the scene. This is a, an example of this 
back and forth between I don't know, bi biographical decision or instinct and what she, her clue, okay? Um, you, you probably remember this if you, if you study the book. She, she says, um, she's, she, she talks about it. Um, she says, this sad event made a great impression upon my younger days for these relatives and companions of my youth died and were buried on the same day. Um, the coffin of the last name resting on those of the others. She talks about it a little more, but the, so, so here she is, she's in 1897 in Washington. And that's what she's, that's, this is what comes to her when she um, reconstructs her, her childhood. Um, I, I didn't say that this, um, this is a portion of, of a long opening sequence. It's called, it's called Death and Dances. This portion of the book goes from 1848 to her marriage in 1862. Um, it deals, among other things, with the chief's children's story, um, which, is a, which is a story in itself, most of which, um, most of which I can't read, obviously, but, um, but this is, this is the very first mention of Lilio Kalani in written history, so in English language history. And I think that um, in Hawaiian history, in, in Hawaiian Hawaiian history, in oral history, there are name songs and bird songs and vanilla and so on. But this is, this is how she appears. We expect one new one in a week or two, a little girl, not yet three years old, a missionary teacher, Juliet Cook, who with her husband Amos was in charge of the boarding school for the next generation of chiefs, started by the mission at the request of the present chiefs to her New England family in the summer of 1841 when the child mission was first proposed. She will add much to my cares, already too heavy, but there seems no other way. The Catholics will have her if we do not take her. If she lives, she will be a high chief, and we feel as if we could not refuse her. Entering instead a year later, still under four, the new one was scarcely more eager. In the morning, Lydia came, but she soon began to cry for her kahu when I let her go and told them to keep her until we were ready, and then we would take care of her, Amos noted in his journal on April 14, 1842. It was another month, May 24, 1842, before she spent the night. In a perfect biographical world, the writer would be able to follow the unwilling child through the door of the austere wooden building, watching her eat, sleep, play, and learn until she emerges eight years later, reading, writing, and already enjoying what she would call one day the consolations of music. May 8, 1847. But often, as between April 14, 1845, when she was sick, September 2, 1846, when Amos writes, this is Lydia's birthday, the eight-year-old scholar, which is what Amos and Juliet call their charges, is not referred to at all. Nor, again, in contrast to what is the case for several of the other scholars, have any of her own journals or other writings survived. When she pops up, as she does occasionally in the teacher-monitored journals, of some of the older children. The mentions are just as unrevealing, containing only such logistical observations as that on an 1843 trip around Oahu, on which the older girls were on horseback, Lydia was on her little wagon. And on a trip the following year, while most of the other students were again on horses, Lydia and the young schoolmate closest to her in age were on the beer. So, so to try to understand her experience in the chief's children's school, you have to look at the school. Um, you can't you can't look at her because there is no evidence. And I'm I'm not I'm not going to to read this. It's it's, it's there's too there's too much to read, but. Um, 
the school was a place of, of great struggle um, between Amos and, and especially the older, the older boys, and particularly, um, particularly Moses, Moses, who was the one who was being buried in this, um, in this opening, he was buried here. Um, Moses and Amos were, were really at war. Um, Moses was very difficult and unsavable from Amos's point of view. Um, he uh, was always sneaking out. He, um, he wrote a. Um, do you, I don't know. I don't know how much of this is widely known and, and how much isn't known at all. But he, uh, he wrote a, a sort of escape story. The line that's always quoted from it is, I, I, I cannot live in the land of my birth, for they have shamed me, or something like that. Because he's always being punished um, by, by Amos Cook, and he's put in isolation. Um, there's a, it's, you have to imagine what it was like to be a little girl while there's, while there's this big struggle between between Amos and the older children. Um, I think um, I think she decided to be a good girl, basically. And the, my concluding line of the part I'm not reading is, um, um, oh, just, uh, the lessons drawn by the young elite vary according to their natures and times and must be read in their lives rather than in words, but for the unobtrusive nine-year-old Lydia, who had managed never to bring any of that wrath on herself, it seems to have been something like one of the rules the children wrote in their journals, speak not too loud nor too low. As the influence of the missionaries determined the fate of the kingdom in more ways than anyone at the time could know, she became what she would remain until political circumstances required her to be otherwise a good girl. <coughs> But now we're back, we're back to 1848, which um, also is, leads into the ending of the school. In the fall of 1848, as Lydia turned 10, the good and the bad, the young and the old, the converted and the unconverted, and the chiefs and the commoners alike were caught up together in the great waves of illness and death that reduced the population from 93,500 84,200 in the space of 24 months, and brought the school, along with everything else, to a standstill. Confirmed by Hawaii's leading modern statistician, the facts continued to horrify. The crude death rate was 88 per 100,000 inhabitants in 1848, and 50.5 the following year. Deaths outnumbered births by wide margins in both years. Horrifying, too, are the experiences of those who lived through it. Some cases were distressing in the extreme, Juliet Cook wrote in a letter to Amos's family. One house on being entered was found to contain four dead bodies. They had perhaps starved to death, all sick at once, and no one able to go for food. Another case of a man and woman occurred where there were other houses with people in them in the same yard. One remark that their door always seemed to be shut and went to see if they were sick and found them locked in each other's arms, dead. Within the school itself, the atmosphere could only have been one of terror, and news came in from outside the world of the walls, whose father or cousin or cousin was now gone, and the children fell ill themselves, one after the other, no one knowing who would recover and who would die. This is from Amos's journal. James, Peter, Lydia, Emma, and Elizabeth have had their worst day. Most of the chiefs, which he sometimes calls them the chiefs, were taken down yesterday. Amos recorded on October 24, 1848, the first of a week of entries naming every child in the school until November 1st. David, the last, has been taken down today. As their servants failed too, both Amos and Julia and the children, as they were able, took over the chores of milking, chopping wood, cooking, sweeping, and all the rest, when possible, going out into town to deliver such medicines as they could contrive. But as for studies, the school was closed, 
its routines dominated by the sustained confrontation with death. Gravely ill in a house in the nearby royal compound lay Moses, two years gone from the school, but not from the lives of the royal children, nor from the mind of Amos Cook. On Friday morning, November, 20, November 24th, hearing that Moses was worse, um, all the children went to see him, followed by Amos himself, who reminded him that Jesus Christ alone could afford him assistance. <coughs> I hope so, Amos noted that Moses replied. A few hours later, he was dead, preceded earlier that day by his loving Hanai mother, who had vowed not to outlast him. To all human appearances, he died as he had lived, without God and without hope. So far as he is concerned, we fear that our labor has been in vain, but we hope and pray that his untimely end may prove a blessing to the remaining members of his family, and to the king, and to his parents, and to the chiefs generally. Amos wrote to his sister, invoking Psalm 52, 23. The wicked shall not live out half their days. But it could not be a blessing to any Hawaiian. For more than a month, Moses' body lay in state beside those of two other young members of the royal family, with whom he would be buried when the grave diggers caught up with the dead. Leziohoku, 27, but in vice an aged man, Amos pronounced him, father of the young chief with whom Lydia was paired every Sunday for the walk to prayers. And Ka'imina, Ka, is an argument for me, Ka'imina, Ka'imina, Ina, Ka'o'o, three, the sister of Lydia and her older brothers, uh, David and James, who was to have joined them at the school shortly. Every day, some of the children went back and forth between school and palace, watching over the corpses and trying to comfort the king. At last, December 30th, 1848, came the great royal funeral, but long after she was no longer Lydia, Lelio of Kalani would never forget. Moses was at the bottom of the hole, Lelio Hoku next, Kadamina Ina Abuola, sorry, on top. As they stared down into the hole, dressed in their Christian best, the children who had been chosen by the waning generation of chiefs to guide the Hawaiian kingdom into the modern world could only have wondered who among them would live to rule and over whom they would rule if they did. Beside them, as they grieved, stood Amos Cook. They tried to display great pomp, but my soul loathed the whole affair, he wrote in his journal that day. I'm going to jump way ahead. Actually, first I'm going to make a, I guess it's a procedural comment about, or comment about biography, and that is one of the, one of the most difficult and sort of fundamental acts of, of, of biography, and especially in the case of somebody as, in, as, as centrally involved in, in the great historical event as the Queen, is the periodization. How do you, how, what, what are really, what are the phases of the life? the phases of, of any of our lives, and, and how do those phases fit with the political history. Um, in the case of the Queen, obviously the political history has always dominated, and you know, if you didn't really think about it, you'd think that her story began, and, you know, it, it well, began and ended almost with the overthrow, which of course we know is not, is not the case. Um, so that's, anyway, it's, it's an essential act, and um, this comes from a much later, really two pieces from a much later part of the book. So that one, that, that section, the whole first section is called Death and Dances. I told you this one. Um, that's followed by a, by a section that goes from um, 1862 to 1874, her married life, it's called Mrs. Dominus. Um, and, and now we're at something called, is, is this all there are of you? It's uh, essentially, it's uh, called Akawa's reign. Um, so it's 1874 to 1891. And um, the 
phrase is this all there are is of you, which you which you'll hear in the text is his spontaneous cry um, when he's on one of his royal tours and he's passing um, he's passing through a near an empty village. It's in a letter and he wonders why there is why there are so few people there. So so this is a chapter, and I, I don't think I've emphasized enough that this is a work in progress. This is, um, so this chapter is certainly not in a final form, but it's called King and Brother, and it's about uh, the relationship between, between the sister and brother. It begins with um, a letter to uh, Kalakawa from Lilioka, from Lilio. Um, in 1874, and he's in Washington. I had no idea that in the absence of one man there should be such a vacancy. And I must say that when you went away, there was a feeling for, of want for a man you could look up to and feel we had a head over us all. Liliu, not yet Liliu Kalani, wrote her brother in 1874 when the new king was in Washington speaking to Congress about the Reciprocity Treaty and dining at the White House with President Grant. There had never been so much ocean between them. Two years older, he had been there at the Chief Children's School when she entered as a tearful four-year-old in 1842, and he had been there ever since. He was there when they buried their littlest sister and two cousins in stacked coffins in the same grave when she was 10, a day that would haunt her entire life. There, when they lost their oldest brother, whom she mourned with shaved head and broken teeth a few years later. There, at the deathbeds of their parents and at the probates of their shared parents. There, at every death and funeral that drew them closer both to one another and to what they would each eventually become in the history of the Hawaiian kingdom. Both publicly and privately, their lives were inseparable. Lydia was still in Maui when David and the older brother, James, were summoned from school to the Honolulu Fort for the hanging of their grandfather, High Chief Kamanawa, but she too would share its burden. They were together with the rest of the royal children when the kingdom was taken over by a British naval officer in February 1843, together when the unauthorized action was decisively repudiated by another officer in July together at an official luncheon aboard the latter officer's ship that became another lifetime memory. The impact of the 1843 loss of sovereignty on the minds of all of the children who were to govern Hawaii cannot be overstated. The, you may have seen this quotation. The king feels as if he was a ruined man, and our scholars feel somewhat so, schoolmaster Amos Cook reported to his family in Connecticut after the seizure. They tore off their gold hatbands from their caps and wished to take the buttons from their coats, saying as they were no longer chiefs, they did not wish to wear any insignia. But the kingdom had been restored. For 10 days following the raising of the Hawaiian flag on July 31st, the whole community gave itself up to festivities and rejoicing, and the day became a national holiday. On the fourth anniversary, July 31st, 1847, Thousands of people, including Lydia, now nine, and David, eleven, gathered at the same home of the king, Kamehameha III, to celebrate the restoration of the kingdom with an enormous feast. And of course, that's the occasion of the proclamation, the, the pronouncement of, of the motto. At the time of this great exaltation, there was no such thing as a Kalakaua dynasty, and little likelihood that there would be one. And I'm going to skip all the Kamehameha genealogy and the elections of 1872 uh, and again 1874 because you know, he knew all that. It's, it's done now. Now he's king. Now he was not only brother, but king. There is no doubt about the family's pleasure in coming out at last of the shadows of the Kamehamehas, and indeed coming out literally. For the king at once took up the royal copy of burning torches in daylight, a right belonging only to rulers of exalted descent. Whereas other chiefs might have torches borne before them during the night, 
The blood of Kalakaua claimed the tributes of an unquenched flambeau both night and day, explained a newspaper account of his royal progress to Kauai soon after his accession. And from then on, his appearances were marked by blazing displays, always described by onlookers in words like stupendous. And it was not only the king who was elevated, it was all of them, Nalani Peha, the four heavenly ones, as they began to be known. It was Liliu, who was 36, their sister, Like Like, who was 23, and their youngest brother, Lelio Hoku, 20, who was named heir apparent. The crown of the kingdom is for the four ruling chiefs. This royal flag is there, long may it wave. Um, Liliu rejoiced soon after in a song, Kahak Kalona, Kalona Kalana, the flag of the crown. Um, soon uh, celebrating their um, ascension to uh, their rightful place. And how would they not celebrate it? As he made his way around all the islands on the traditional progresses, sometimes with his sisters, the new chief was welcomed by his subjects with such fervor that there was little doubt that the Kalakaua dynasty would be embraced. For Lilia, the change was especially momentous. Both her birth and her, her Hanai parents were trusted advisors to the royal courts, so she had been close to power her entire life, but she had not actually held it. A pattern that continued after she married John Dominus, who, as a result of his childhood friendships with Kamehameha IV and Kamehameha V, had long been part of their inner circles and was now the governor of Oahu. Twelve years into an unhappy childless marriage, Living with John and his cold American mother in the Washington Place mansion, always referred to as the governor's house rather than hers. She was now a princess in her own right, a station that must have been difficult even for the dowager of Mother Dominus to ignore. Never before was so splendid a display witnessed in these islands, the newspaper wrote about the prince returned to Honolulu from Molokai with his wife, Queen Kapilani. Their carriage was draped with flags and drawn by some 50 schoolboys through the street. The Princess Lydia and Governor Dominus following an open sedan chair, borne on the shoulders of men, while on either side and proceeding, and following were numerous torchbearers. From the wharf to Elani Palace, the streets were one blaze of night of light. Washington Place was so near the palace, really it was mother-in-law, but hardly from his grave. Disappointed that she was not to be heir apparent, she also understood it. With her empty marriage and empty womb, she was much less likely than the charming young lady of Hoko to produce a successor. And it was the succession, more than any of them individually, that now mattered. In any case, she was not to be overshadowed long, for the continuing swath of deaths that cut down the elite, as it did other native Hawaiians. Leili Ohoku died in 1877 at 23, and she became next in line. It was then that she became Lulio Kalani, uh, Lulio of the Heavens, I think, a name chosen by her brother to enhance her royal standing. <laughs> From the moment of Kalakaua's accession, the lives of the siblings were increasingly entwined. For the future of the dynasty and the future of the Hawaiian kingdom were now the same. With the birth of a baby, Kaiulani, which Liki Liki, in 1876, and folded into the lives of her childless aunt and uncle as much of the, for the pleasure of her as for an heir. There was hope for the line for another generation, but it was precarious. In spite of marriage and motherhood, Liki Liki was, it seemed to Lilium and David, reckless, often fleeing her Honolulu household and husband and leaving the care of the precious baby to others, endangering both herself and the family. One of the most frequent themes in family letters in the first years of the dynasty is anxiety. Take good care of yourself and try to avoid anything that could bring on accidents, for we all have our hope in you for the future, Lulu had cautioned Ike during her sister's pregnancy. 
We all felt very anxious about you, and others are just as anxious. If you are ailing at all, always consult a doctor, for we cannot spare, spare you, she reminded her a few years later. Um, this is from the brother. The last week has been one of great anxiety to all of us, owing to the illness of Katiolani, um, Kalakaua wrote weekend when Katiolani was four. I must say it was something very serious, and had it not been for the prompt action of the physician and the continuing watchfulness, care, and attention of those in attendance, she would have died. Fortunately, as I write, she is now considered out of danger, or I would have sent the Lahua for you. The Queen and I have been out here ever since the child has been ill and do not intend to leave until your return. Fortunately, Lydia came back by the Homoka Lee. I have been amusing the baby by buying her curiosities to keep her from despondency. At present, she is comparatively well, but at any time she may have a relapse. With Leaky Leaky less than eager for her official duties, her older brother and sister relied principally on each other. Inevitably, the royal siblings had their differences, of which much was made both in the gossip of the day and in subsequent <coughs> histories. Deeply unlike, yet tightly bound, in many ways closer to one another than either was to anyone else, including their spouses. The king and the crown princess might quarrel one time over a political appointment, another over protocol for a royal procession, yet another over Liki Liki herself, and still recline comfortably in one another's company at the enormous luau's of the king's boathouse, dance together at his balls at the Alani Palace, and dissect it all thoroughly over breakfast there the next morning. Whatever else might also be happening, their connection to one another, and to the responsibility that they alone shared for the preservation of the kingdom and its people was never broken. In 1881, when Kalakaua traveled around the world when Emilio Kalani was regent, it was to her that he wrote some of his most serious letters about government, religion, and the ongoing crisis of the Hawaiian people. To save the life of our people is to work and not pray, to find and stop the causes of the death of our people, and not to cry and whine like a child and say to God that it is good, O Lord, that thou hast, hast visited us thus. He wrote her from Cairo in June, after learning of another smallpox epidemic on Oahu. I only wished you were with me. I've gathered so much to advise you and our family in particular, he wrote from London the next month. As for Lilliu and her, the love of the man and the love of the office were now so mingled that it would have been hard to say where one ended and the other began. From his swearing in to his death and forever after, she rarely referred to him, even in her diaries, without capitalizing the word king. I'd like to read. Um, I'd, I'd like to read the, about the bayonet constitution, um, even though it's not. It's not. You know, the queen is out of the country. But it's going on, but it's so fundamental to uh, to how it happens after. And then I want to read it, and it's also it's also the one piece of this book that that I've wanted to or had let be published. So I mean, it's easy for me to read it from this. This is just the literary magazine of Pacific University where I've been teaching writing for a number of years. So it's just called saying does anyone want to stretch? <laughs> you want to you want to take a I'm I'm okay if everybody you know everybody has to sit so still. You want to, anybody want to move? Anyway. <laughs> I think it's harder to listen. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, a lot of quotations in here. Um, I think they'll be obvious. Sort of what, what they are. It's, it's one of the better documented episodes. Um, up until that point, I think later, in the period that my time is written about, there's a bit more documentation, but this is one of the more that I've encountered. 
Um, on June, so this is much later, on June 30th, 1887, as the heir apparent, Princess Lilio Kalani, was awaiting the steamer Servia for her return from London, where together with Queen Kapiolani, her brother's wife, <clears throat> she represented the Kingdom of Hawaii at the celebration of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Her brother, King David Kalakaua, by election as well as lineage, the rightful successor to the throne of the Kamehamehas, was confronted at Iolani Palace by 13 determined men, straight from a mass meeting of the country's white-led commercial circles, whose purpose was nothing less than to end the native monarchy and institute a republic to be controlled by themselves. It was a venomous meeting shoulder to shoulder in the crowded armory of the Honolulu rifles, while outside, militia stood ready to provide whatever protection might be needed. One speaker after another denounced the king's this, iniquitous misrule and extravagance and calls for immediate action, whose approval by the assemblage is best seen in its response to the one speaker who wanted to proceed legally. Great uproars and cries of, no, no, sit down. We waited as long as we could stand it, and when our Anglo-Saxon blood could endure it no longer, we screwed our courage to the sticking point and went in for a revolution, exulted one of the participants in the meeting a few weeks later. King John and the Magna Carta and the Battle of Bunker Hill were also invoked. <clears throat> the problem with the governance of the kingdom from the point of view of the, quote, revolutionaries, was the king himself, who under the constitution granted by King Kamehameha V in 1864, had the sole power both to appoint and dismiss his cabinet members and to veto legislation. Their plan was to present Kalakaua with a set of resolutions for the meeting addressing particular abuses they felt flowed from this autocratic structure. And when he refused, well, Every man of us had a rifle and bayonet and a hundred rounds of am ammunition and was ready, and in some cases, eager to use them. Up to that time, it had not entered our plans that the king would yield and thus save his crown, continues the above account, but unexpectedly, he did. Understanding that the, to get the crown, they would also willingly take his head, he calmly let visitors know that he had substantially complied with their, cap with their demands already, most importantly, accepting the resignation of his cabinet, including the longtime prime minister they particularly detested, and requesting one of the gentlemen specifically named by the mass meeting to form a new cabinet. Now they were in a quandary. For all the months that their conspiracy against Kalakaua had been in the making, they had taken for granted that the constitution under which they would hold power would be a republican one, but the king was not going away. Astounded and perplexed, they returned to the drawing boards to devise a new document that would accomplish the same ends, but by other means. The constitution with which the new cabinet re returned to Kalakaua only, only six days later is the most infamous document in Hawaiian history. It is the edict Lilio Okalani was attempting to undo six years later when she was overthrown by the same men now presenting it to Kalakaua. Known as the Bayonet Constitution, it was a double coup. In one stroke, both undermining the ancient chiefly rights on which the Hawaiian kingdom was based and redefining the very composition of the population the kingdom was understood to include. Not only did it leave the king unable to act independently of the cabinet and the legislature, it opened the suffrage to non-citizens, which together with prohibitive property and income requirements, guaranteed that it would be the foreigners of the business community, not native Hawaiians, who would be doing most of the electing. To understand what was at stake in the struggle between king and cabinet, it is necessary to understand that while by this time for many white people the Hawaiian monarchy was little more than a pleasant fiction, for native Hawaiians it was all they had left. A report dated June 30th, 1887, the same day as the mass meeting, puts the, Hawaiian, uh, the native Hawaiian population at 44,232 
a decrease of 41% from the 107,954 counted in 1836, the year of the King's birth. The losses were at once personal and universal. Whole families and villages had simply disappeared. Pausing at land he knew well during his royal progress around Oahu after his 1874 accession, Kalakaua, who by that time had lost six of his own nine siblings, seems to have been much affected that there were so few people there to greet him. Is this all there are left of you, he asked. His predecessors had been similarly affected. Reports of the rapid decimation of the native race caused me a severe pang of sadness, staggering in its intensity, Kamehameha III had told his people in 1842. Kamehameha IV in 1855 said, the decrease is a subject in comparison with which all others sink into insignificance. To Kalakaua II, nothing was more important than restoring not only the bodies of the Hawaiian people, of their spirits. His motto, Ho'olo Wahui, is usually translated increase the nation, but it can also mean inspire the nation. And it was that hope that tied together many of the projects of, of Kalakaua's administration that his enemies found embarrassing, wasteful, and inconvenient. The gleaming new Ulani Palace completed in 1882, they saw mainly reckless expenditure. But they had not traveled around the world as he had the year before, seeing in capitals from Tokyo to London the importance of such an assertive centerpiece in maintaining national pride. In the long public party that was the King's 1883 coronation, they saw mainly a meaningless indulgence made all the more sickening by the command performances of Hula, an offense repeated at his 50th birthday three years later. But they did not care, as he did, about the deep displacement that had accompanied Hula's suppression decades before, nor its centrality to any hope of cultural renewal. In his scheme of uniting Polynesia into a Hawaiian-led federation, they saw him merely irritating the great powers like Germany and Britain, then signing each other's addresses in the Pacific. But what mattered to them the letters to the king from Tahiti and the Gilberts beseeching their sister Polynesian kingdom to take them under its wings, in preference to the foreigners suddenly showing up on their shores. As long as he used his powers and their interests, the business community accepted the king's authority, in many ways basking in its benefits. But when his attention turned to his own people, they called him a tyrant. Unlike the good counselors, that is, themselves, on whose advice he had traveled to Washington in 1874 to promote the free trade agreement with the United States, on which their prosperity now rested. His later, his later ministers first, in their words, a subservient lot drawn from beyond their social circles, whose expenditures for his fantastic enterprises over those they preferred for roads, landings, and wars undermined their prosperity. Surely they could find a constitutional principle here. Dear sister, we are just passing through a tremendous crisis, happily averted since, since Tuesday, uh, 28th of June of last week. Kalakaua wrote Lilio Kalani on July 5th, 1887, in a note that awaited her in San Francisco. But the king was wrong. The power he had hoped to preserve through his appointment of a new cabinet was already lost. The very day after his wishful messages, the four new ministers whose appointment he had hoped would forestall the crisis confronted him with the hastily developed constitution that both he and they knew would mean the end of native rule. Previous Hawaiian constitutions had been granted to all the people by their kings. This one was being dictated by some of the people to the king and it left the Hawaiians out. This is the quotation from Thurston. Unquestionably, the Constitution was not in accordance with the law, neither was the Declaration of Independence from Great Britain. Both were revolutionary documents which had to be forcibly effected and forcibly maintained, wrote one of the leaders of the insurrection, 
now one of the new ministers later. But there are revolutions and revolutions. It is true that like the beleaguered despots of their grandiose rhetoric, the king sat isolated in his castle while, quote, the people, quote, controlled the streets. But who exactly were the people? When the king boasted after his return from abroad that unlike the mightier sovereigns he had met on his royal travels, he could mingle with my people without dread, these were hardly the ones he had in mind. No one will ever know the full contents of Kalakaua's heart as he struggled with his four white cabinet ministers over the Constitution presented for his signature during the course of that fateful afternoon. What we do know is that he had reason to fear for his life. Outside the palace, his newly resigned prime minister had been dragged from his house by a squad of the Honolulu rifles and nearly lynched, and the king knew that. Threats of violence were everywhere. The, the king argued, protested, inquired as to the effect of certain changes, and for considerable periods appeared to be gazing into space and weighing the probabilities of success in the event of a refusal to comply, another of the four ministers recounted later. But he can hardly have had any illusions. Even in the meeting, he was not necessarily safe. Quote, more might be written of the arguments made and physical attitudes assumed toward the king by members of the cabinet on that memorable occasion, but let it suffice to say that little was left to the imagination of the hesitating and unwilling sovereign as to what he might expect if he refused the demands then made upon him. He kind of continues. The last king of Hawaii was a hard man to destroy. In spite of what they liked to believe, at no time had he ever been a creation of the foreigners. From his earliest experiences in the missionary-run boarding school for the children of the chiefs, he had understood that their interests in the kingdom were not the same as his own. And though he had successfully accommodated them, particularly in the crucial matter of the reciprocity treaty with the United States, he had never lost his focus on his own people. No one grasped better than Kalakaua the cultural richness of the Hawaiian past, nor its importance for sustaining the natives now. Had our first teachers in the new regime been men of scientific tastes, a great many of the oral traditions might have been collected and preserved, but aiming only at the propagation of their own tenets, the recital of old Malays was considered criminal for a period of nearly 20 years, he wrote in 1872, two years before becoming there was crushed out with a deadly blow the only landmarks of Hawaiian civilization. It was for the Hawaiians that the very things the Haole scorned had been undertaken, for the Hawaiians that he had brought that hula preserved the last, last extant Hawaiian creation myth and told the story of the Hawaiian people from the beginning, compiled the comprehensive collection of legend and myths still, legends and myths still on the shelves today, and it was for them he would wish the dynasty to survive. At the same time, he had not been much of a manager. Not personally unscrupulous, none of the charges of corruption against him were ever proven. He was, rather, indifferent to cost, pursuing his visions and leaving the details to others, while budget outflow continued to exceed inflow in a way that terrified those same Anglo-Saxon hearts. What he was was irrepressible. It seems he could not resist a good time. He spills eagerly out of even his most formal photographs as if neither uniform nor throne can contain either his bulk or his spirit. The very opposite of his sister, whose portraits from a young age seem already almost presciently solemn. That this large-minded, large-hearted native Hawaiian king should be surrendering his chiefly heritage to two Britons, one Canadian, and the grandson of American missionaries is surely one of the words world's irreparable wrongs, but that is the story of the bayonet constitution. They had arms, and he did not have arms. Danger was imminent. At the very last moment, he called in another official who knew exactly what was happening in the streets and asked him, in Hawaiian, must I sign? And the official told him he'd better. David Kalakaua loved being king in the manner of the old Hawaiian kings. 
but he also loved life, and he was a man as well as a king. He signed.
were seen only in the tainted testimonies of the trials that followed. But her situation, to say the least, was precarious. The plan was that armed neighbors coming in from Diamond Head would set off an uprising in town, seize key buildings, and force the Republic's surrender. But in practice, it was the opposite. Troops surprising the rebels at their gathering point before they had even started out, and chasing them into the surrounding mountains where most quickly surrendered. A white man and a few natives had been killed, others hurt. Within hours, the city was under martial law. Everything shut down. Um, the government rounding up anyone thought to be associated with the royalists. 20 or 30 men their first sweep, more every day. The annexationists blamed the queen herself. Um, from a poster um, uh, that went up all over, over town, um, it's, it's, the poster says, for her bloodthirsty and criminal nature, as well as her role in the conspiracy, we ask her immediate arrest and imprisonment like any other common criminal. Um, it's a petition, actually, that went around all over town. But the government situation was also precarious. Not only were there still rebels in the mountains, but with information emerging only in bits from the various prisoners, the scope of the rebellion was not yet fully known. Nothing reveals more about the true state of relations between natives and whites two years after the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy than the minutes of the Executive Council as it debated the staging of the Queen's arrest. And you can go over here and read those. Um, so these are all going to be quotes. So so and so spoke in favor of arresting her at once, using the arguments that the natives still looked upon her as their elite. But if she was arrested like an ordinary conspirator, it would remove that impression from the native mind. That's one entry. Another so-and-so was against it because, quote, the troops were all still in the hills, and if she did still have a following in the city, it would be better to have troops centered here when the arrest was made. Uh, so-and-so number three did not know what effect her arrest would have on the natives. If a quieting effect, well and good, if it would arouse them, he was against it. So and so four also did not know what effect uh, her arrest would have upon the natives, but it was positive that it would create great satisfaction among the supporters of the government. Besides the risks of both further inciting the natives and antagonizing American and British opinion, which, as yet another of the members of the Executive Council put it, still had a certain amount of sentiment in regard to her, um, the Executive Council faced an additional quandary in the timing of the Queen's arrest in absence of evidence of her complicity. However unjust their very existence might seem in the minds of the royalists, in their own minds they were models of legal decorum. A first search of Washington Place had turned up a collection of antique weapons belonging to John Dominus, but it was hardly enough. With the capture on January 14th of the captain of the Queen's Guards, Sam Nolan immediately agreed to cooperate. They knew they could get what they wanted. 9.50 a.m. on January 16, 1895, nine days after the insurrection started, they made their move. The only photograph of Radio Colony's arrest is taken about a half hour later. It is a newspaper photo. Um, you've all seen it. She sees the photographer take it, and not very clear, but it practically weeps with the pain of the moment. Queen at the bottom of the palace steps, staring up at the building she has not been in for so long. The center of the monarchy of all Honolulu. The struggle to accept her fall, perhaps hinted by an odd tilt of her body, as if her feet are unwilling to take her where her head knows she must go. The grounds, not shown in this photograph, are filled with artillery and soldiers. She has just driven through a military campground. Inside is the great Cohen staircase that once separated the ceremonial and the private floors of the royal headquarters. And in the hall at its top, she sees a life-size portrait of herself as queen, somehow overlooked in the takeover. And it is only then that she almost cries, wiping away a few tears with a handkerchief, while members of the government working in the converted bedrooms crowd their doorways and watch. A few more paces, and she is officially delivered to her chambers. The set as she has been in the two years since the overthrow, she was still, nonetheless, a free woman. 
Now she is a prisoner. Everything she reads, writes, wears, and eats is to be monitored and inspected by the guards outside her door and subject to the judgment of the authorities higher up. She is particularly worried about her health. I was very weak and threatened with paralysis, she wrote in notes made a few weeks later, and it clearly showed because her doctor would be allowed to come in daily. She is also worried about her lady-in-waiting, so anxious about her husband, a prisoner, that the queen has practically to attend to her as much as the other way around. A sigh, a sigh, and a sigh, the Leo Kalani remembered she heard all through their first sleepless night. When morning came, we were not much better in spirits or in health. She heard, too, the rattling of arms and the beating of drums every now and then from below. As ominous as it is to be in that room, however, what is more ominous is taking place elsewhere. Washington Place is now conquered territory. On the day of my departure, scarcely an hour passed before the Chief Justice came to search my house, whether for paper or firearms, making a thorough overhaul of all my bureaus, wardrobes, and shoeboxes, and leaving articles strewn over the place, she wrote, all over the place. The next day, everyone living there is arrested, along with the retainers on her other properties, about 40 people joining the prisoners already crowded into the police station or the reef. It is January 17, 1895, two years to the day since she was driven from office, an anniversary cheered by the government, which, bypassing the civil courts whose jury include natives, has ordered a hand-picked military commission to open its courts martial that very day. The day after that, the commission begins hearing cases, starting with that of the former guard, Sam Nolan, whose confessions had made him the centerpiece of the prosecution, and who, along with two others, pleads guilty to charges of treason. More cases are to follow, and more and more and more. The Queen's chambers are directly above the throne room, where the government is pointedly holding the trials. In spite of her confinement, a few people are allowed to come and go from her room for specific purposes, and however softly they talk. Treason carries the death penalty. Riding in the carriage on the short drive from Washington Place to the palace on the day of her arrest, the Queen had wondered in my mind what they were going to do with me. But it's not only herself that she is wondering about now. Her supporters are subject to the verdict of a hostile tribunal with rules invented specifically for this occasion and to the judgments of a vengeful city. What was going to happen to them? The answer was that they were going to die by hanging. Honolulu was in a panic. The feeling is that we have had a very narrow escape from a desperate encounter, a member of the government wrote a friend. There is the most intense feeling amongst the better classes of the community that some capital sentences should be imposed and carried out. It is difficult to give you an adequate idea of this intensity, especially among wives and mothers. Shortly after the first trials, it was hinted to the Queen by one of the visitors to her chambers that it was possible a formal application would help soothe those better classes. It was not an official offer, only some lawyerly thinking. Practically, such an act might be meaningless because as far as the government was concerned, she had abdicated when she yielded in 1893, so was already no longer Queen. But with bargaining um, of all these cases going on downstairs night and day, as the prosecutor sorted the cases out, perhaps the queen could be bargained too. The queen's position was the opposite. She had yielded, well, only temporarily, and to the United States, not to this illegitimate government which had claimed to succeed her. But she agreed to think about it, and a lawyer sent around a few drafts. The abdication signed by Lilio Kalani after a week's imprisonment is the most abject political document to which she would ever put her name, the word she uses herself in the autobiography uh, written a few years later. Um, insulting, she also calls it. It twice calls the people who supported her misguided, names the Republic, quote, the only lawful government of the Hawaiian Islands, and declares, quote, 
the late Hawaiian monarchy is finally and forever ended in so many ways it pays inadvertent homage to the solidity with which it once existed. It is also intrusive, combining the termination of the monarchy as an institution with so many shades of renunciation personal to the queen herself that its reading alone would have had to and did cause pain. I hereby, without any mental reservation or modification, fully, finally, unequivocally, irrevocably, and forever abdicate, renounce, and release unto the government of the Republic of Hawaii and its legitimate successors forever all claims or pretensions whatsoever to the late throne of Hawaii, she was made to say. Notwithstanding the gossip about the seeming self-interest of her capitulation, the Queen thought <coughs> that it would save the lives of those in prison for treason. For myself, I would have chosen death rather than to have signed it, she wrote in the autobiography. And I believe her. Death was no stranger to Lilio Kalani. She had lived with it intimately her entire life, as had every other native Hawaiian. One of only two left of the 13 students deemed eligible to rule who had entered the chief children's school 50 years before. The last of her own royal brothers and sisters. She did not necessarily want to go on. What she did want was to prevent the deaths of any of her people that might be possible to save. The same wish that had guided much of the course of her reign in the first place, as it had of her brothers before her, and of the late Kamehameha's before them, including the decisions that led to her downfall. I still believe that murder was the alternative, she would write. Among the more disturbing aspects of this humbling of Lilio Kalani is how little it actually mattered, and not only because more was to come. According to the rules of storytelling, the collision of so many interests and passions against the background of the gallows ought rightfully to be a climax, but it was not. It cannot be conceded that such rights and claims as you now voluntarily relinquish have had any legal existence since January 14, 1893. Republic's attorney general was quick to tell her. Many Hawaiians also ignored it. To them, Lilio Kalani was not only a queen, she was a chief, and a chief could not be removed by a piece of paper. It was a deeper authority than politics. On January 24th, 1895, the day she signed the statement, perhaps even as she was signing it, know this story. I don't know why this, this is an important story. So she's signing the paper. It's a quote. The court was startled by the fall upon the table of a massive bar of plaster from the lofty ceiling of the throne room, nine feet long, precisely fitting the length of it. It was here in the cases of the first large group of natives charged with treason at the time. Okay, everybody's sitting there. In the throne room. Really, the queen is above the throne room signing this paper in this chunk of plaster, exactly fitting this table, crashing down on it. Some thought the old kahunas must be working, must be watching. So unaffected were many natives uh, by the abdication that the government translated the statement, which was in English, into Hawaiian on a special flyer with a large black Hawaiian headline reading, Pay attention, you Hawaiian people. Stop your illusions. But their trust continued. A few months later, an American correspondent reported from Honolulu that her act made no difference in the native loyalty to the monarchy. So that's all I'm going to read from my book. Um, but I want to close with something from, um, I want to close in the queen's voice. Um, not, and not my own. Um, and it just made me remind you of, of where, where I started with sort of how complicated it, it is to, how complicated a life is in relation to what you can do, what you can do on a page and how you separate it. And this is, um, this is a, in a way, it's a, it's a random letter. It's not a well-known letter. Washington, the head of her. Um, but at the moment, she's home. It has a phrase in it that stayed with me. Um, the phrase here is, you ask if I am happy. And I, I do. Have to 
after she was released. She was in that house arrest for six years? No. No? No, just a matter of uh, just months. Pretty much. Um, the, um, house arrest? Yeah, January to September. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it wasn't until months. So the setting of 1901, what was it like? Oh, she's, she's home. She's, uh, yeah, she, she had been traveling back and forth. So this is from Washington Place. But we don't know, no one knows, I don't know, think anyone knows much, I don't know who this letter is to. It's just, it's just my very dear friend. And I guess it's, it's about complexity. It's about, it's about, the, it's about life not being only the dramatic story that we, that we remember. My very dear friend. Your delightful letter of the 23rd of January has been received. In fact, it's been in my possession a whole month. But my time has been so occupied with business that before I was aware, time had slipped away, and so rapidly. Though I often think of you and read your letters over and over and think of those days gone by and of our dear ones who were in that better land only gone before us. Well, the present is what we have to attend to, and in the absence of that dear one, all complications of this life fall back on me. I have to attend to all matters myself, although I have an agent it is more satisfactory to attend to them myself. You ask if I am happy. Well, yes. I do not trouble myself with the affairs of others, but I have the love of my people, and I am happy in the thought and knowledge of it. But there has been a division in this way. Some became Republicans, others Democrats, and the majority became home rule independents. They all love me. But you know I'm out of politics, and that is where the trouble is. It comes in different groups. I make light of it. There are some who want to take the little I have, and there are some who want my property, who go to a judge to serve an injunction on me, and I cannot do what I want with what is my own. Another man brings a summon from the judge that I should not sell land for my own property because it belongs to the territory of Hawaii. Now, my friend, haven't I enough on my hands? Then all I have is mortgage because I could not pay expenses after the overthrow of my government by the missionaries. But with all these troubles, my maker has been good to me, for I have not suffered in spirit, and when night comes on, my sleep is undisturbed, for I do not lay any weight on the goods of this world, at least not enough to make me worry. We're having delightful weather, so cool and pleasant, that from appearances we may have a cone of storm. But for it to rain while the sun shines, the old ones say, that these showers are for strewing the petals of the flowers of the mountain apples, preparatory to the coming of the fruit. Then another shower for the opening of it. It's so very poetical, the idea is. It's where the other stops. And so that is where I'm going to stop. That's <laughs> you. Questions? I'm still working with my hand. Ah, but go ahead. <laughs> which part makes which part is the most? Almost everything. Almost everything. Almost everything that needs to be discussed. I mean, not at you, obviously, but at the yeah, uh, common one that you met. Yeah. Yeah. It's different. Yes, I, I, you know, you may, I mentioned about, um, I think during talking about, and it was so much, and it was so rich and, and so uh, moving, but it was sort of, they used the word tyrant. And I think they talked about color, color as, um, as some aspect of, of tyranny that they, the ones his detractors. So. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me of, of Elani Irwin's um, recounting of uh, the Queen and she um, in uh, St. Andrew's Cathedral. She's sitting in the front, and the new American uh, bishop of the Episcopal, the Protestant Episcopal Church that's, that's in my view, ousted the English bishop. Mm -hmm. He says, how nice it is that the, that the tyranny has ended mm -hmm. and that you are now a part of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And he said it in the pulpit while with the Queen standing in, in front. And it just is raw. All that you've said is, is like a raw. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it rubs a nerve. But it's so illuminating. And so I, I thank you. But that's what made me think about it. I've, I've not forgotten, I've just boiled yeah. when I think about it. 
this, does um, Erwin say, did she make any further comment about it? Can you I just remember that one one comment that the, that the Queen, um, she said that the, the Queen looked ahead and made no facial recognition, no said no, no word, that she was gravely insulted by this, um, this um, sermonizing yeah. of this new bishop, Rus Rusterick, I think he's called. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that came to mind when you used the word tyrant. Mm -hmm. I think that must have, she must have had that experience a lot. Well, we must all remember that in 1839, Hawaii became a constitutional monarchy. So the monarch was still another job. Now, if Queen Elizabeth advocated today, does the UK fall apart? So she advocated her position, but her use of legal discretion is always in question. But in Buddhist axiom, what goes around comes around. 1980, the United States Embassy in Tehran was under siege. And for 444 days, the only water they had at the United States Embassy in Tehran was in the swimming pool. All that chlorine, chemicals, and whatever is in the swimming pool. They did that for cooking, uh, eating, uh, bathing, and everything else. So the United States paid a debt. Now, as far as King Kong Paul is concerned, he was assassinated because on a hot summer night in San Francisco at the old Palace Hotel, he was served a nice cold drink mixed with broken glass. He drank it and he was assassinated. But during the Vietnam War, the Viet Cong did the same thing to the US, uh, United States troopers. What goes wrong? I was wondering if you knew when uh, Hawaiians dying from disease sort of ended in large numbers, and why? Why did the large numbers of dying from, from diseases stop? Do you know when, when the curves, do you know, do you know when the curves started? Sorry to change. Well, Kim Mahalani um, Fox is Abahalani Fox is somebody who's just put out all this incredible material on health. And 1848 was a, a was a you know a pivotal year of this dying, as you say, on a more But um, if you are interested in that those health statistics, um, this a young PhD student just put all this uh, documentation together and is doing presentations. So the dots are being connected backwards. In other words, we're having this chance now to see from all sorts of sources these remarkable revelations of things for all of us. So it's who, who is the yeah. person doing her, her name is Aloha Lani Fox, and she's over at Oha at the moment, but she's doing her PhD work and or has finished it. She's very her presentations are really quite <coughs> packed. Anyway, just in your research of Queen Leopoldani, have you come across any of the information on the jewelry that was auctioned off in Houston, Texas in nineteen fifty-two? Or any of the other jewelry items that were auctioned off after the overthrow? Not really. I really I haven't that. Have, have you? Have you yes, I have. There's actually a letter in the archives in which David Kalakawa has sent a letter to Lilio Kalani in regards to a locket that was given by their brother with a photograph in it with her that's on display in the basement of the palace. It's a relatively new letter. Is that, um, is that there it's now? It's the same archives, part yes. of the exhibit now? It came in from another estate. But there's a number of pieces that are missing. and. Queen Lilio Kalani Children's Foundation, some of those items are purported to have been auctioned off 
for the foundation. And so I'm curious if you would find any of that information in any of your research. I, I have a um, look for it, but there, there is a woman, um, a woman named Linda Bradley, who was a, a faculty member in a school in uh, Eastern Washington, who has written about per, more personal items like that. She's written a lot about dresses and gowns and so forth. She, she, may, she may, might be a source for you to, to go, go through there. I wanted to make a comment, kind of ask a question. I hadn't thought about the fact that the, in the Chiefs Children's School, the, those journals that were kept by the cooks, there is really not much at all mm -hmm. about the Queen. No, I know. That's really weird. And just because I'm a friend with O.C.D. Douglas, mm -hmm. who yeah. must have read every single document in the cooks' mm -hmm. journals, which covers all of the children that lived there at the time. Yeah. And some of the horrendous things they went through. Pretty yeah. awful stuff. Yeah, it, it is really awful. Yeah, it, it's really terrible and pretty yeah. abusive. Yeah. And um, so my question, yeah, I do have a question because it's just to myself. How come? Those, those kids were put in that school. How come? How come? It, it was a, one of the things I don't get about it is, they're so close. It's all in, the, it's all in this royal compound. It's, it's all it's here. Like, uh, they're here. They're here. And, you know, the, the, the it's parents the of the king or, or, or you know, they're nearby. And there's some visiting, so they know um, something of what's going on. But by the way, the Cook's journals are now online. Um, you can just go through them yourself. At the, just so selectively, Hawaii, Hawaii. selectively just seeing some pieces, mm -hmm. I think, but I don't know, because well, I haven't read it. But you can, I mean, it used to be that there was only, I don't, I, I don't know, that it was only the clearly expurgated versions in the, in the two volumes of, of, mm -hmm. of Richard's books, but it is much easier to look at them, but it isn't going to make things that... You mean a reference to Moses, who yeah. was one of the brothers who sort of disappeared? Disappeared from history? Yeah. And then brought him back, and others are bringing him back. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. yeah. His, um, the seating, that was a mutual friend, of him, actually has Moses, got Moses' journal, from the Bishop Museum, which would be a story in itself, but not one that I, that I can tell. But the, the journal is shocking. There's been the suffering of Moses in particular. Uh, is, is really... Anyway, that stuff is online. You guys should go read it. Well, I don't think Moses' is journal is online. You know, but it it is. should be. A lot of it is online, and I think Moses' journal excerpts are available someplace. Did CD put them on? Did somebody put them on? It's not, it's not gone online, but I know she has copies of everything. Yeah. Is he still buried over here? Or was he Moses? I don't know. I don't know where he's buried. I think maybe he was one of the ones that. Well, he was buried here, but I don't know whether he was moved or not. I have a feeling he was, but we have to look it up. You had mentioned a will that surfaced with her. Which will? Because there was two. Well, I think I was quoting her. She said in the, in the autobiography, she says the only document that had been that's returned to me that was found, you know, that's in the Judd portion of the finding aid was my will. So, so she had to be referring to a will that she wrote before 1895. Uh, I I'm not sure, but I think you're referring to a will that um, was, that came you know, toward, toward the very end of her life. Because her, her guardian introduced another will. Right, but that was, that was much later, yeah. I think, so that would have been in the 1950s. I was, I was thinking there, there are the earlier wills than, than 1895. But right, but any time a will is wrote, then the will before is automatically canceled. Right. 
Right, but it would still be interesting to know people as reflections of thinking or priorities or whatever. But I, I actually I plan to look for them on this trip, but I don't know what's there. What do you guys think? Oh, um. What do you piece together about you know the rifling of her desk and how part of her diary ended up in the archives and part of it ended up at the Christian Museum? Boy, I I I wish I understood that. I, you you haven't solved that mystery. You know, I don't think I don't know who could solve it. I'm quite sure it wouldn't be me. I do know. Do you know that David Forbes found, and I don't know where, um, he found a diary that's, that's always been missing. Um, it's the 1889 diary. Is that the Wilcox? That would, uh, that would prob that probably will throw a light on what her relationship was with the Wilcox. And, and you know the sort of movement to unseat um, Kalakaua in that period. So I don't know where that one was. I think I gather it was not in either of those places. I have no idea why why some things are one place. And I think somebody could reconstruct it. of Lilio, this whole trove of letters that, that you know, I don't even know <coughs> all the details, but all, this stuff is all, this stuff is now surfacing everywhere, different places. What, what are those? Do you know what they are? You know what, I'd have to kind of think, my, I mean, with all of this information tonight and that, I wrote some stuff down, I'll, I'll think about it and let you guys know, but I, I, you mentioned something about her shaving her head and Breaking teeth. I was really intrigued by that. I think, was that something that actually she did? Mm -hmm. That that is from a newspaper. Um, I, mean, I, I could tell you. I could give you the exact citation yeah. for it. Um, a classmate of hers in the Royal School, I mean, after after the Chief Children's School, was somebody who lived in Maine. Um, it was defending her character in the period where she was being so um, viciously attacked. Um, and this classmate 
published a little letter in the, I think it's the newspaper, where she describes, describes this. I know it's very surprising, but I do have the citation for it. Yeah, because I wonder what, what validity there is to that. It's an unusual thing to mention, and I would love to know the time frame. It's just kind of an unusual. Well, if it's the year that James died, um, which would be after, at least in the 1850s, or maybe 1850 itself. Hmm. Um, so that would be the year, but um, just I can find it for you. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, it is, it is a very uncharacteristic um, description, to say the least. Yeah. Anyway. I like the headings. I like the, the mm -hmm. thing about looking at, at death. It's something that characterizes your life, early life, and basically you see a lot of it. Much accepted the fact that death is is it. Right? Just saw so much of it. I mean, it's, it's very even even though there are places in the world where where now where death is an everyday massive death is an everyday occurrence. It's still hard to grasp it when you what would it be like to be. This is such a small place and such a small small population. There's numbers that are, are staggering. You know, there's a, it's not in anything I brought, I don't think, but it was an, uh, another really major epidemic that was in 1804, Kikuni was about the 1804 um, dying. And there's a missionary comments or other observer comments and saying that the people died of despair, mm -hmm. which which is a, it's an anthropological um, matter, I guess. No, people are still dying of despair. <laughs> oh, Dr. Jane. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your presentation. You, know, you always hear this history about, you know, like, well, okay, this is what happened to you, and, you know, but you don't really get the visceral kind of like impact it had on her. And, um, you know, you know, you, you hear the stories, right? I mean, you know, when Cook stumbled upon the place, it's like a million Hawaiians. By 1890 census, it's only 40,000 left, which means that 95% of the population died. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you understand the impact of that, but you know, the plague, it, I think it took off like 20, 30% of the, the population yeah. of Europe, and Europe collapsed. I, I'm just amazed that anything Hawaiian survived. And that collapse, loss of you know your cultural resource, people, stories gone. And um, yeah. the other issue I have is that she presided over this time of just this turnover of the whole thing. I mean, go to the old Hawaiian society, and it was a mutual care kind of thing. It was aloha, you know. Is this in this man? This was from um, something in the Hawaiian Journal of History in 1983. The second person that I'm interested in, and I want to know if you came across, is Joseph Aya. Joseph Aya was her Luna, and he did their inventory of her properties just before her birthday. And I was just sort of wondering. Just before her birthday? Just before her birthday, she would do a, a, a that inventory, and Joseph Aya was her Luna. And he would go around. And, and inventory her that. I read this from her own personal letters that mm -hmm. someone allowed me to borrow. Mm -hmm. So I know it's real. Mm -hmm. I just, so I thought maybe just who I am. Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, it sounds from, I, I don't, that's spelled for me. Um, is it A? Uh, yeah. Is um, it with an E? It's A-E-A. -E -A. A. Yeah. I think I ran into it, but. No, I don't know anything, really. Thank you. But the, the theme of death, which is so, is so depressing, I mean, you would really rather find, you'd rather find another theme, and yet, and that's really what 
leaps out. You know, the question of when did it begin to change is, is a really important question, I think. And also the, the recovery of, of the culture and the recovery of, of the history, the work that's being done now, is, is really remarkable. By contrast, um, when we had the commemoration for Her Majesty's um, hundred, uh, hundred, hundred year passing, my experience and many others, when they when in the play when they said, and the Queen breathed her last, the heavens opened up and there was thunder and lightning. Uh, were you there? I don't know. But that spoke volumes to me about. This, may, this is very raw, and there's lots of death. But, but in that moment, the gods and, and I believe in my heart, the queen herself answered and, and demonstrated uh, very much present. And I, I, hope, I hope I'm not being uh, crazy when I say that, but that's just what I feel. <laughs> and so I walked home in the rain, basking in that, in that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd love to ask the group, um, there, there is, is the minutia of what we hear tonight, and then the things are what really appear to me to be the most profound. They're the little things that, you know, when you think about grand scapes of death and destruction, you know, whether it's Genghis Khan or somebody, you, you don't you don't appreciate that all of this was so um, profound in the collapse here, and yet it wasn't really apparent. I don't know how else to put that. It's kind of an odd thing where it's not gross things of mass death. And I mean, it was, but but by the perpetrators, it was a different kind of evil. It was a different kind of death that was perpetrated. It has a very different weight or feeling to it. It's not like, you know, some marauders coming in and just lopping off heads and, and putting people in prisons and leaving them there to die, you know? It's a different, there are different kinds of deaths that I feel that, that when you talk about that tonight, I wasn't, I wasn't really thinking that, um, that's so powerful, but it's the, in the minutia of the things that have happened, whether it's the rifling up through the desk to me, which was so profound. They're, they're small things. They're not these, do you, do you guys get what I mean? I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's an odd thing. It's hard well, to convince I recent, people. I recently read about Kaneohe and how vibrant a community was, and only a few years later, it was like, gone or so reduced that, and then you stop and think of all the families and all the history that was lost. It, it's shocking. It's different than a war where, but it, you still have that in war also. It's just, it's a different mentality in my mind. And your, and your source of that reading? Your source of that reading? Oh, heavens, I could not tell you. Is it St. Andrews? No, I don't think St. So. Andrews writes about that. Kaneomi. Hmm. Anyway, so I have a question for you. What, um, what do you all think in, in Hawaiian experience in, in this history is relevant or Relevant to or useful for the rest of, for the rest of the world. I mean, it's so it's so intense here. And the experiences are so intense, and and the I think the recovery that's going on is is I keep saying is remarkable. It's there's, there's so much documentation that you can find about this process, you know, whether it's it's not. It's not the process of, of a war as such. It's a different process. But there, and there's, there's, there really is so much cultural richness here. But how? And I, it's, my question isn't how would you compare it to the rest of the world. Like my, how how can it be of 
value or use to the rest of the world. What's, what's universal in this experience? What are there are there lessons in, in Hawaiian history for the? And then I go back and, and look at the, what was being published on the continent and the horrific manner that Hawaii was being portrayed, their OED and so on. And, and then to recognize that their literacy rate was so much higher than what it was on the continent. Uh, they were so far in advance. I mean, but yet people on the continent believed this propaganda. So, I mean, even today, we can have a hurricane barreling down on us and nobody notices, although we are in the news right now because we're running the sirens and it's been on the national news, you know. But it's still kind of ignored. And I, and I don't know whether I like, you know, should it be or should it not be, but what's relevant to the rest of the world, I don't know how to answer that. I don't either. Yeah. And, what? You know, the, part, of, part of the story um, that seems like it may have relevance to some other areas would be after the takeover and through the so many years, what's the change in culture? You know, what did people do? Might have been very simple things, but what was happening then? And then fast forward back to the Renaissance and, and what made that movement? And that's, the, that's an amazing story in itself because many other cultures might be in that same situation of almost dying now and having the opportunity to try and move. Yeah. And grow. But unless you can tag in a piece around that time, uh, the other would never occur. Things were happening within the family, within, they kept some of the important issues uh, together. And, and it may not be directly in the government at the time. But I don't see that picture yet. I don't know if it's an important one to, to set the foundation in the face that later on. And, and many cultures are in that place. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think that's a good point. There are many layers to this. You know, and some, here's the thing what happened here, a lot of what happened here, the taking of the land, the, the, the killing off of the people, the um, clearing of the land, clearing of the land through disease and other other things. It's historically, I mean, it's happened not only here, but all over the, the world. But the fact that the, but the fact that the Hawaii is like a macro, microcosm being out, out in the ocean by itself, isolated for so long. I mean, now, not now with Facebook and everything else, but back then. And, um, but um, <clears throat> the fact that it was recognized to be an independent country and had so many treaties and politically put itself in this position, I mean, it, you talk about the literacy, you talk about everything else, even the savvy to go out there and do this, yeah, to an um, international scale. Um, to me, it shows the leadership foresaw a need to do this. And so, um, it's diff it, it, different in this way than, let's say, um, the indigenous people on the continental United States. Um, maybe some did have treaties internationally. I don't know. I've never researched that. But, but to me, it, it makes it different in, in positioning. But um, 
a lot of the same themes run through, like disease and everything else. Yeah. And some some tribes disappeared. We don't even know the names of. Yeah. You know. Um, but before they came across the United States, they did it to their own people. Yeah. They did it to their own cousins. Yeah. You know. So. Um, so there are, if you want to talk about universal themes and threads, that would be, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of them. It's just a, a different interpretation, or different, different uh, scenarios because of our position in the world at the time. Yeah. Does that make sense? I guess I'm okay. Would be, it would be great, I think, if people if, uh, were able to find, if other peoples were able to find themselves in the Hawaiian experience. I guess that's what I'm getting at. As the experience becomes more tellable because of, of the resources that really are here. My, my Hawaiian experience is, and it's in the family, it's part of Lori. It's in my family, really deep. And it's only because my grandpa uh, well, most of the, uh, uh, the ports here in, in Hawaii, as well as Marshall Islands and so forth. So that uh, Naino and Thompson went around touching every port of Oregon. Um, that, that's